Welcome to this BAFTA E Rising Star panel. I'd love to welcome Daniel Kaluuya and Timothy Chalamet. Thank you. We're going to take a <laughs> lots of caffeine needed this weekend. We're going to start off with uh, just, I don't think anyone needs a reminder, but let's take a quick look at trailers from Get Out and Call Me By Your Name. You got your toothbrush? Check. Do you have your deodorant? Check. Do you have your cozy clothes? Got that. What? Do they know I'm black? Should they? You might wanna, you know? Mom and Dad, my black boyfriend will be coming up this weekend. I just don't want you to be shocked that he's a black man. <laughs> I ain't never seen you like this before, bro. Meeting families, taking road trips. Don't come back all bougie, man. Come back, get your damn pants up to your damn stomach. <laughs> <laughs> So you guys coming up from the city? Yeah, we're just heading up for the weekend. Can I see your license, please? He wasn't driving. I didn't ask who was driving. I asked to see his ID. Call me Dean in a hurry, my man. So how long has this been going on, this, this thing? <laughs> <laughs> we hired Georgina and Walter to help care for my parents. When they died, I couldn't bear to let them go. smoke in front of my daughter. I'm gonna quit. She'd take care of that for you. How? Hypnosis. I'm good, actually. Are you ready for this? I'm back in the beat. So look, I go do my research. Apparently, a whole bunch of brothers been missing in this suburb. But it's cool. Bro, how you not scared of this, man? Couldn't see no brother around here. Chris was just telling me how he felt much more comfortable with my being here. Get out. Sorry, man. Get out! Yo! <laughs> Bros, we gotta go. Is everything okay? Bros, the keys. Just get the keys. I don't know where they are. Bros! Sink into the floor. Wait, 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 wait. Sink. Oh, my. It's a terrible thing to waste. Terrible thing to waste. Too many white people are getting nervous. <laughs> no. No. No, 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 no. Oh my, it's a terrible thing to waste. Professor Pearl, I'm Thank you so much. So nice. It's been very confusing. I can show you around. That'd be great. Thank you. So what do you do around here? Read books, transcribe music, swim at the river, go out at night. That sounds fun. All right, later. Just watch. This is how we'll say goodbye to us when the time comes. Later. <laughs> Meanwhile, we'll have to put up with him for six long weeks. <laughs> Muscles are firm. Not a straight body in these statues. They're all curved. Sometimes impossibly curved. And so nonchalant, hence their ageless ambiguity, as if they're daring you to desire them. Oh, to see without my eyes The first time that you is there anything you don't know? Boundless by the time I cry. You only knew how little I know about the things that matter. Build your walls around. What things that matter? White noise, what an awful sound. You know what things. By road. You're saying what I think you're saying. Feel my feet above the ground. You shouldn't have said anything. Have Just pretend you never did.
just want to say what a year for both of you. Two BAFTA EE Rising Star nominations, two BAFTA Best Actor nominations, and two nominations for that award, other award ceremony that's not as important as this one. Um, <laughs> just want to start off right at the beginning, though, kind of, it seems like that perhaps this is a breakout year for both of you, but there's been a lot of hard work for many years along the way. Did acting find you, or did you seek it out? <laughs> oh, really? um, yeah, it kind of found me. Yeah, it's a bit. I was being a. Can we swear? <laughs> can we swear? Is are we allowed to swear? Do whatever you want. <laughs> Free space. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, I was a shit. Uh, <laughs> so I was a shit at school. So then it kind of. So a teacher told my mum, like, you should get it out of your system. And um, and then I did writing as a kid. So it was kind of like just. I just did stuff, and I was like, and then. Um, I had the opportunity at Anna Shares um, to do improv, and then I did that, and then I was like, oh, well, I like this. Uh, and then I saw people making money. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, cool, let's try this. And then I just fell in, just fell in love with it, so it kind of was just really natural. Yeah, and uh, I guess same for me in some ways. Um, I, my mom had, had been an actress, and I had a grandfather who was a screenwriter, so um, I had done it a little bit uh, growing up, but what really was the impetus for me was getting to a performing arts high school in New York called LaGuardia, and I just, I remember being 13 on the first day of drama class, really falling in love with it and seeing how much fun it was, and, you know, the, 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 more, the more seriously you took it, the better you got at it. Daniel, I guess with a lot of the audience here growing up here, we um, would have seen you on Skins, and also that was a training ground. Not Bing. Huh? Oh, no, Bing is Black Mirror, right? Black Mirror, yeah. 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 I'm sorry. But we'll get to that. Yeah. 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 Um, with Skins, a training ground, not only as an actor, but also for you as a writer. Yeah. Um, what kind of, what, how did Skins come about? Um, I just kind of, like, I, I had a, my agent was funny. It's a funny dude. <laughs> they were dodgy. And then, um, <laughs> so I was like, well, I've got to do my own thing. And then, uh, and I just started writing plays and, uh, and acting in them and directing them at Heat and Light Theatre Company in Hampstead Theatre, which is, doesn't really exist anymore. And then, like, and then Skins were looking for young writers. And so I got Skins. It was me, Dev, and Kaya were at the same open audition in Holloway. We was all there. And then um, they found us just like we did that. And then I, I joined as a writer. And it was just that kind of... Yeah, we, just, we were just doing, it was like people that went to the open audition were already doing it extracurricular, like doing extracurricular activities, so they were into it. So no one was really trying to get like, because it was an E4 show, like, E4 those times just showed Friends and Scrubs, like, <laughs> it wasn't a serious channel, like, so we were just doing like, we were just like, oh, this is channel, like, we can do what we want, so like, we just did what we wanted, and, uh, and, uh, and then it just became a, became a thing out here. What was your kind of first career, first break into the world of acting? Uh, you know, there's two that I keep in my head. One was a commercial I did when I was 10 years old for Disney, or Disneyland, I guess. So I went down to Florida to the theme park. And uh, it's funny, they had three kids cast. There was like an American version, and I had to do the French-Canadian version. So that was my first dialect work. They had me memorize how to say, what an awesome vacation, but with a Canadian accent in French. <laughs> um, and the other one, as, as it is for a lot of actors in New York, the mothership, it's uh, Law & Order. That was like my first uh, like real acting gig and I got my throat slit and then Anthony Anderson comes up to my body and he's like, that's a dead body. And, uh, <laughs> so that was my first, yeah. The first corpse. Um, first corpse. For, uh, for getting, obviously, to get out and call me by your name, both astonishing films, but both essentially small, Indies when they started out. Um, let's start with kind of Call Me By Your Name. How did you come on board to the project? And how long was it before it kind of even got to that stage of making it? Yeah, well, I was 17 years old. I met with Luca Guadagnino for the first time. That's the director of the film. And, um, and that was really by luck of the universe. I mean, I didn't have the acting credits really yet to justify that kind of meeting. But my agent, Brian Schwartzstrom, represented Tilda Swinton, who's the lead of a lot of Luca's other movies. So when this project came around, I could kind of, I uh, was presented for a meeting with him as someone that could maybe play this role. And Luca historically doesn't like to audition his actors, so he said, you're attached, but it felt like, you know, 
hopefully this comes together, but that summer it didn't, the summer after it didn't, the summer after that it didn't too, so I thought, you know, I, I don't know if this is ever gonna happen. But then when I was 20 years old, in like the span of months, it really rapidly came together. And, and I was thankful it took like that amount of time. I think if I did it when I was 17 or 18, well, I don't know if I could have done it at 17. I don't know if it would have been legal to do it at 17. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but like if I, you know, doing it later, just having a couple more years of experience, being able to be a little bit more calm. Like Daniel and I did an interview a couple months ago, and I'm like very proud to be up here right now. I'm not like bouncing all over the place because the first time we did it together, I was like, oh, it's <laughs> tense, so. This was part of that interview as well was before kind of both of these films had been, no, Get Out had been released, but I don't think Call Me By Your Name had been mm -mm. released at that point. Um, playing Elio, um, he is kind of a renaissance teenager mm -hmm. in a way. Um, what was your research process in Tim? Did you read the book and also kind of, you don't remember the 80s, but your experience <laughs> of being a teenager in the 80s, it's so nuanced in particular, which right. you know is captured so well. Right. What, how did you go about doing it? Well, yeah, like you said, it's the, the book. The book becomes like a Bible of sorts. And for those that have read the book, it's fiercely from the point of view of Elio. So there's just so much to pull from and there's, there's a lot of background information. And then as you, you know, pointed out too, there's a lot of piano playing and I had to learn Italian for that too. So there was a, you know, about a month and a half, two months of, uh, of a background research going into it. And, um, and then when it comes time to do it, you just try to let that all go and, and do the best job you can. Get out. Um, Jordan Peele's script, when it first came to you, kind of, what was it like on paper? In terms of trying to make it genre specific, it's not. I would say it's like magical realism with a bit of horror, with a thriller. Like an exploration of race relations. Did that all come out at you on the page straight away, or were you like, oh, I'm not quite sure what this is? No, it did. It did. It was all there. Like, it's just, for me, I kind of read scripts and go, does, do I feel like the writer knows it? I mean, and that's my thing. It's like, you kind of don't really need to know the details, because do they know the world? Does it speak to? Because I've got, like, and I've got good friends around me that are good bullshit detectives, like, when they watch <laughs> films. So they're like, no, that doesn't make sense, that doesn't make sense, that doesn't make sense. So I always see scripts from their angle. Go, does it make sense? And if it makes sense, that means they've done the work. So, um, so I kind of felt like, and then it just spoke to me, because it spoke to me, because I've been a black man at that, par at that party. So it's, um, yeah, it was just, and there was elements that were surreal, but because he knew the world, it didn't, it didn't matter. Do you know what I mean? It's like, it's grounded, but there's it's just otherworldly things like brain surgeries and stuff like that. So it was, um, yeah, no, I, I knew he did the work and it just, it just tapped into something and it was like unapologetic, which is, I find really exciting. Um, were you kind of, was, was there ever a hesitation of taking on the role or did you, from reading it going, I know this is the person I want to play Chris, I want to do this role? Or was there kind of a level of nervousness kind of jumping into it? I knew Jordan was going to get in trouble. Like, I was like, you're going to get in trouble. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I like trouble, man. Like, <laughs> I'm like, that's what we're here yeah. for, no? Like, I don't, this fucks you up, man. Like, <laughs> like, I, I, can't, I kind of like, cool, if, at least I'm going to go down doing something I believe in. If it goes wrong, because anything can go wrong. And so it's just about stuff that if I believe in it, then I go, I can stand by that. Do you know what I'm saying? And I go... Because that's the script that could go wrong in the wrong hands. I mean, and so there, there was just that. So I read it. I remember there, were, and there, but there were moments of doubts. So I'm like, when I really wanted it, or when I got it, I'd read it again. And I go, am I crazy? Like, when I think about the storyline, or I'll try and explain it to someone, <laughs> I'd be like, yes, guy, like, you're trying to, you've got a girl, but you have to get out of the house. <laughs> it's like, wait, I need to read it again. Like, <laughs> I read it like four times before I even started shooting. Like, before we started rehearsing, and then I was like, oh, you know, it's all right. No, I like it, I like it, I still like it. Um, so it was a lot, of, a, lot of, um, a lot of that, but I think that's normal. I think anything that you're, because I'm putting my face on something. Same with like, you're putting, your, you're, put, you're putting yourself out there, so you have to be doubly sure about, but they're usually the first decision is the right one, and then just the world comes in and compromises you. I thought it was fascinating when you said that Jordan really wanted to cast you, but the only thing he was nervous about was that you weren't American and that you, that you were British. Yeah, so it was that, there was a lot of that kind of like, because I think in America they don't really know about stuff that happens outside of America. <laughs> so I'm about to say, oh, I'm getting in trouble for that. Oh, it's going to be a long week. Uh, uh, <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, yeah, but so basically, like, I just basically, he didn't know, he didn't know the black British experience. Yeah. So, because a lot of people don't. I think a lot of people in England don't. Mm. So then, like, so then he just asked me a couple of questions. I was like, yeah, yeah, I know, I know what's happening. Um, <laughs> Do you think you're both kind of uniquely placed in that way, kind of you're born and raised in London, born and raised in New York, from these cities that there's no, nowhere like either of those cities in the world, kind of we're surrounded by kind of culture and diversity and you pe meet with people on a daily basis that are not from your world in a way. And do you think that kind of shapes both of you as, an act, as actors having, you know, has it made it easier because you've been able to connect from kind of birth with people from all backgrounds? I feel with me, it's like you just have to adopt a different perspective. Like my next door neighbors, my next door neighbors were Turkish. Next ones were Irish. Like they were like whatever, like I think Eid or something. They'll give you presents, and so you have to adopt. You have to understand. You just have to see the world different. Like I was brought up to see that, like the way I live my life isn't the way everyone else lives their life. So you kind of when you see characters and you're able to take on other perspectives and empathize. Um, when uh, it's not black and white, it's always a, a gray. That's, um, that's what London's kind of taught me. Yeah, I feel the same way too. I mean, I, I think about it in, in context of family and, and uh, my mom was a third generation New Yorker, but my dad was French and he moved there as I was growing up. And uh, I, I've always felt like tremendous ambiguity in the self-identity apartment, which is maybe not great for mental health, but as far as like acting goes, it's kind of great because I don't really know what I'm stretching from when I do roles. It's, I don't, when I watch myself and things, I don't see the differences because I don't really know what's going on here, so. <laughs> Has the last year, in a way, surprised you? Have your lives changed dramatically in kind of the last 12 months with the success of these two films? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, like, what I'm really grateful for was calling by her name, and I can I, I don't I I'd be curious if this was the experience on Get Out because I remember being in New York when Get Out came out and it really it was like an explosion like everyone was so excited to see it and the posters were everywhere and the great thing is like I haven't had the total destabilizing experience I think you can read in interviews sometimes with other people where it's really like an overnight switch or something and what's amazing is like when I see people or people stop me in the street. Or I've seen you a couple times. Um, <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> that's, <insane. laughs> that's it's always it's it, it hasn't been oh you're in that show you're in that movie it's oh you're in Call Me by Your Name which is a book that really means the world to me so that's I mean you dream about that as an artist really like that's that's been really nice for me to experience because I have seen people I've admired in interviews maybe not be so comfortable with that but I've like, I enjoyed it any time somebody's like, you know, that they read the book or they like the movie. Where, 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 where have you seen her? <laughs> <laughs> where have you seen her? She was in London the last time I was here. All right. Yes. How you doing? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> my life's changed, man. My yeah. life's changed, like. Yeah. No, but the thing is, I'm trying I, I hide, didn't I? You told me you couldn't come back to London the first time after you get out. No, no, I just, yeah, I had to, I, I came You can go home. home, you can go home. I couldn't go home, like, because I went... I went back to the estate, so I was like, yo, like I came out, I was like, what the like? And then and then I you just get, I just, I always hide, didn't it? I go like, I'm never, I just don't really want to engage with it. I just, I like, and then, so like now I think it's probably going mad in LA and I'm here, so it's great. <laughs> so it's like, but it's just like you kind of, you kind of, because you, you, I don't know how my life's changed because it hasn't, it's gone up a notch. It mm. keeps on going up a notch. And you don't know what is the norm, new normal now, mm. you know? And I'm not so just saying it because we're here. This is like, this has been the great thing about having a friendship with Daniel is all these stops we've been doing. I don't feel like I relate to any, or very few people in the room, but I can always lock eyes with Daniel and we'll be like, what the fuck is going on right now? <laughs> yeah. 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 But you've obviously, you've both made some really interesting and very clever choices. To be fair, in the films you've done, you know, with Lady Bird and Call Me By Your Name, Black Panther, Get Out. Black Panther, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Are you nervous about kind of what you're going to accept and what you're going to do next? Is there a level now of expectation that, wow, this Well, there's a get, the, the Get Out universe and the Claim by Name universe yeah. are fusing. And uh, <laughs> uh, nobody liked that. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, no, I mean, um, 
Yes and no. I mean, again, this feels like, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm very young, and yet there have been a lot of auditions that are no's and meetings that are no's and projects that you're a part of that get made but aren't necessarily well received. So this feels like appreciation time, and there's maybe two weeks left of having this nice kind of moment. So what comes from there will be great. I don't know. I, I find the one thing I keep in my mind is like, hey, you know, have res you know, respect the uh, uh, respect the reception. If that makes any sense, and you know, you you have to try and be in the pedigree of Lady Bird or Call Me by Your Name or Get Out. You can't, uh, you know, you can't saw that out. Daniel, do you think you'll go back to writing? That's what I've been doing. Yeah. That's what I've been trying to do. And then get out. She's gone mad. Like, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, no, I, that's what I'm, I'm writing a, a TV show and a film. So I've been doing that more than acting. That's what's quite surreal for me. It's kind of like, like all oh, this is. I just made a couple of decisions. I was like, oh yeah, I'll do that, I'll do that. And then it's just like, whoa. Because um, I was just kind of was like, oh man, like I just felt this urge to like to to to, to write, and and, and I got loads of ideas that I want to like make and, and you just have to put the hours in because you're reading and they go, oh, this is shit. Like, uh, and you're like, <laughs> I need to get back. Like, you know what I mean? You just have to put, the, there's no shortcut. No. You have to put, the, I mean, you don't want the shortcut. You want a long cut. The long cut is always more interesting. So you have to just do the work. Um, so yeah, like that's, that's kind of where my, my head's at, where I'm, where I'm heading and then, yeah. And the thing you're writing is you're a part for a young, skinny. Uh -huh. Now you got bone cut, bro. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> No, there is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I'll text you, I'll text you. Okay. All right, all right. <laughs> okay, we've got time for a, a couple of questions in the audience. So if you can wait for a microphone. Can you hear me? Okay, cool. Hi, um, my name is Gemma, and I have a question for Timothy. Um, so throughout Calm By Your Name, you do all these like mannerisms, like when you know Oliver gives you the note, like, grow up, meet me at midnight, you do that like, twirl kind of thing, <laughs> and all the little like, slides that you do and stuff. Um, I was wondering like, how you went about developing like, Elio's like, mannerisms, like the physicality of it, and also kind of the emotional psyche of him. Also, I want to say, I meant to preface this with like a kind of thing that she said, but thank you both so much for your incredible stories. Like, they're so relevant to now, and I immensely loved both of them. Thank you so, so much for everything. Um, so yeah, sorry. Your question. Thank you. Well, the question, sorry. Yeah, I mean, that's the great gift of playing someone who's finding themselves, uh, finding themselves as a person at a young age, but also their sexuality and finding their sexual physicality is there's... Um, there's you know, a little form of that expression that, that's wrong. The only thing that would feel wrong to me is if something felt particularly contemporary as a physical expression or a mannerism that you wouldn't see in the 80s. But besides that, you know, I felt like I had free license. That's one of the great things about working with a director you trust and someone like Luca. And I'm curious if this was uh, Daniel's experience with Jordan. But when you feel like you're really synchronized and um, on the same page, it gives you room to fail. And I love all the mannerisms in the movie, I love all the slides and the doorways, all that, but there's a lot of that that didn't make it in there just because there was the room to um, try it out. So uh, as much as I'd love to say I was one of the control room actors, you know, pulling on the knobs and dials, um, those are moments of spontaneity. That's what I like as an audience member. I, I, I like seeing things that feel spontaneous. I feel like there's two different schools of acting, two different schools of audiences, you know, and some people really like to see the person in the control room, and I like to see real life lived on screen. It's such a thanks. It's such a mature um, performance, Elio's is, and there's such a way that you really pull back. So I wonder how you worked with Luca to kind of get the idea of like it is pull back. It could you could have gone all out. Well, this is my feeling too. Was like having a, a little, not a lot of experience, but a little bit of experience as a young actor prior to calling me by her name and going to a drama high school. And I'm sure maybe there's actors in here or young actors. You feel a certain pressure to bring hyperbole to not even climactic, in, in fact, non climactic moments. And you want to indicate, you want to demonstrate how you're feeling because to your director, to the casting director, you want to go, look, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> and that, um, that's, those aren't the performances we love. And I remember thinking, you have the gift to be a lead of a movie, hold it as close to the chest as possible. And I'm an expression, I have a guy with a lot of expression, so. Um, you know, I wear my heart on my sleeve without really doing it. So often, if I can, if I know where I am in a scene or what I'm playing, it's obvious. It's usually like a little too much. And if I'm genuinely in it and I don't know what's going on, and I'm trying to read and react honestly, which is scarier because maybe you won't do something cool and maybe you'll be awkward or 
or whatever, that's more real, which sounds like a cliche or cheesy or something, but that's what you're going for. So um, that's what I was trying to keep in mind. I suppose, Daniel, it's very similar to Chris and Get Out. You, we, as a viewer, everything, you lead us to the point we're always unfolding at the same time you're unfolding, as yeah. in each piece is coming together. Kind of, we're not fed that in advance in a really clever way. Kind of, it's all th seen through you, and every time something is revealed, we're like, oh shit, you know, yeah. you know, oh damn. And so, you know, even kind of the bit with the keys, and you just see it all. You got a realization. How did you work with Jordan to keep that tension? So there is a real great level of tension all the way through. That you know, it could have been lost at any time, but it's just so balanced. How did you keep kind of the the thriller for the audience as well as yourself? I mean, it's like, I feel I learnt a lot, uh, similar to Tim. I, I learnt a lot from uh, Sicario and uh, watching Benicio Del Toro do that on set and then watching the film. And I was like, this guy is a magician, like, because he's doing nothing. He's actually doing nothing. But you feel everything. And I watched it twice. I was like, this is, I don't know. And so I kind of was like, oh, it's the audacity to do nothing, you know? It's, and, and, and you basically allow the audience to project. And, but that's what truly happens in those experiences. That's the, the conflict you're going through. You go, I know you're being kind of disrespectful, but I can't, I can't say that right now. And I have to choose when I say that, but I still feel that. Mm. And so that was in the script. That's what I'm saying where Jordan did the work in terms of the writing dynamics and about having to navigate that. And also, on top of all of it, he's trying to be a good boyfriend. So there's that kind of like, but you know, I think everyone subconsciously knows if you're going through that experience, there needs to be a release in some way. So a lot of times I think people stay for the release and it's just that you just don't want to, what Timothy said, you don't want to indicate, you don't want to show like, ah, oh, you just want to go, all right, cool. Like that, you just want to be real. Because that's what would happen in a real situation and allow the audience in to what this guy is thinking. And then they, they follow and they, and they come to their own conclusions, which may be what you're doing and may not be what you're doing, but that's the interesting bit, you know? It's like, just let, what do you think, you know? And the training ground that you've both had in a way, it kind of was just looking through the list of directors that you've both already worked with in the sense with Greta Goig and Luca and with Denny Villeneuve, um, with Jordan Peele, and I think you've just completed something with Steve McQueen as well. Do you feel that you perhaps like, you know, a kind of, you're just very fortunate in that sense that you know you've had this incredible training ground with these kind of masters of cinema already. What are the key things that you've learned along the way from each of them? Yeah, I, I like, I really like how you put that because I like, I left college to pursue acting and that was one of my big insecurities was I didn't want to meet myself six years from now and feel like I was dumber or something and there hadn't been challenged. And I think it can be easy to be cynical or jaded about show business and think, oh, to do it at a young age, you know, the roadmap is, is maybe not unhealthy. But I mean, like every, like you put it, like every set is a learning experience. And what's been thrilling is, for me, is working with the directors that are as instinctual as actors and that see framing and cameras like as an instinct and the way it's, it's totally foreign to me, the way I feel about acting. And like, I had a small part in Interstellar, but I got to see Christopher Nolan work for 10 days and it's all instinct. It's all like he knows. I don't. I didn't see him like think something through once. It was like nope, there, there, there. Boom, 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 boom. Like he knew exactly what he wanted. So that, that was cool to see. I agree with that. But is it? I'd like even at, when I did Steve, I'd like the first day on the set was this massive scene. Like I like it was just like you know like I'm doing an accent and it was like this big scene I had to do like a really. The one I did the audition I had to do, and it's like a really, I can't say what happens in it, but, <laughs> uh, um, but it was, it, I, and I kind of spoke to him about it on set, because I was really, I was nervous, I was nervous. And then, because I really respect him. And then, um, and it was just that thing when I, I think what he communicated is something that they all kind of believe in. He was like, uh, uh, like he's like, I set the boundaries, do what you want within that, you know what I mean? And then it's like, and then it's like, surprise me, surprise yourself. And that's what the spontaneity that Timothy was talking about. It's like, what happens in the moment? That's the exciting bit, because you can't actually replicate it. Sometimes I do ADR and I go, I don't know how I got there. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. Do you <laughs> know what I mean? Because, because it's the moment. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like, you can't replicate. And that's what is interesting about life. That's what I find interesting about documentaries, because you go, that person, the next day, will be in the same situation and can't say that in that way. 
you know? Because in that moment, they felt like that. And um, so that's my, it's that they, they kind of give, they trust you. It's where you trust them, they trust you to kind of, to trust your instincts and go. And then if, and they'll, they'll be frank, and then you can actually have a conversation, and then they know you're coming from a good place where you, and you're trying to build something, so yeah. In terms of kind of building something, but as I said, you have, in a way, in a, become the master of accents. Um, you, how do you work with kind of, you know, getting the right vernacular and adopting kind of, so, so it seems authentic, so you're not thinking about it as you're doing it, you know, kind of, you've mentioned with the Steve McQueen Widows, but with Black Panther, with Get Out, you know, it's so authentic and there's a level of, you know, I'm not even seeing you, Daniel, I'm seeing, you know, Chris, I'm seeing Wakaba, I'm seeing that person because their voice is so natural. How do you get into that? Mostly fear. <laughs> I'll have a person who I know is from there and go, if they watch it, they will cuss me out. <laughs> so I go, all right, cool. That's why I need to wake up and do all this work. Like, it's got to be an emotional reason. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I'm saying? All, the, like, all this kind of like technique, that, it's like, why? Like, what's your, like, what's your why, isn't it? Like, so that, that guy is going to be on WhatsApp gunning me. Like, so <laughs> I need to get on my A game first. So, like, and so, yeah, and I just, I just drill it. Like, every morning, it's just an, it's an hour's game. Like, I'll just listen. I'll, have, I'll find a person who is that person who I think is similar, and I just listen to them. Instead of listening to a podcast, I just listen to them. And so you work on it like in the background. So because you don't want like, accent and acting are two different disciplines. Do you know what I'm saying? So you like you're doing it, to, but you want to. You can't think about accent when you're doing your job. It's, you can't. It's just it helps you to do your job. Do you know what I'm saying? It makes the character more believable within the world that you're in. But you're still having to express an emotion or carry some story, sort of story beat. So. Uh, I did. Yeah, I just kind of, I kind of just drill it every morning, every night, and then usually I have to work with someone like an accent coach or, or some sort to kind of like, to just to fail, to fail, to kind of go, oh that sounds dodgy, and then I record it, then I'll listen to that back, and then I go, oh that sounds dodgy. I'm I'm harsh on myself. I go, that sounds dodgy when I say it like that. Why? And I go, why does it sound dodgy? Did I I speak to the woman again or the man again? I go, oh this is this, and it's just it's a process, you know. And then, um, but you, it's for me, it's about who is that person as opposed to what does that person sound like? Because then it's like, because accent isn't just how you sound, it's how you carry yourself. It's how you, like, your, your thinking, your, like, attitude. A lot of time it's attitude. If I come and do an American accent like this, I can't do it because I, this is quite London, you know, yeah. how I am. You know? So, like, you just have to find and adopt a, 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 a general or a, a kind of a person within that world that's kind of, like, the generic person. You have to find an identity within that culture. And, and then you, you do build in from that, that identity. What? Sorry, I interrupted. Did you, do you stay in that world in between takes then? Yeah. yeah. I stay in it, and it's really helpful when others stay in it as well, because then you could just talk in it. And people are going to think you're weird for two days, and then, like, <laughs> you're know, just up your own ass. Like, but, like, but then it's just like, you know what I mean? When it comes out, you, you, you just have to do your job, you know what I mean? So it's like, yeah, I just stay in it. A lot, a lot of times, if I'm by myself in the, in, on, in the area, like, I, I stay in it when I'm going shopping and, and stuff like that. So I, because a lot of times they'll throw words at you, and then you have to just say it. You're like, I remember on Sakari, they, they threw a word at me. I'm like, I don't even know what that is. Like, I don't know how to say that in the <laughs> But so I just made sure that, like, anything that comes my way, I can, I am not. Because when you're, once you're scared of it, it shows up in a take. I mean, with Elio staying in character, there is a very definite physicality to the way he is um, and the way that you um, present him. Did it help that you kind of, did I, you stayed in the village where the film was made for a number of weeks and mm -hmm. kind of surrounded yourself in that environment? Did that help and did you kind of stay? Yeah, kind absolutely. Of, I don't think I was aware of how much that helped until I jumped into another project. But I mean, I was there a month and a half early. We shot on one camera, we shot on one lens, so they weren't switching the camera positions all the time and switching the lens. And Luca, our director, he, his company is called Frenesy, and all the members of production had worked on his other movies. So I had this impression that I was like stepping into a, uh, like an Andy Warhol like factory or something, in a great way, like in a, in a I felt very p positioned to succeed, you know, and, um, and, and then when I jumped into the, the next thing I did, which was we shot on a stage in LA, and you're working in a studio and you're opening doors that aren't real doors, and 
that's, you know, we, there's, a, there's a bit I like in Call Me By Your Name where Elio and Oliver are, are going to make love for the first time, and it's kind of awkward, and they don't, they're kind of dancing around it, and the door starts shutting slowly, and it slams. And that's just a trait of the house and a beautiful gift the, the villa gave us that day in such a way that if you weren't shooting on the actual location, it would be more sterile and sanitized. So uh, I, I like the immersion of it. But I, it'll, it'll be hard to replicate that because, like I said, we were there early. It was so specific to the town. And also the beautiful thing about that story, there's, there really isn't an antagonist or a, a plot twist or a moment that you know, characters have to play something. It's a lot of people just being. You, know, you try to be as truthful and real in every scene. And in this movie, it was like, okay, be as truthful as you can. Now go lounge by that pool over there. And I'm like, be as truthful as you can, but have this delicious breakfast right here. <laughs> so there's, yeah, it's a good experience. Um, if we can just briefly also touch on Lady Bird, um, kind of Greta Gerwig, writer, director, actress, it kind of a triple threat in yeah. that sense. But how was it then working with someone that obviously knows your world from being an actor as well, mm. but also from the other side kind of has written the script and is directing it? Yeah, I mean, well, the script was so tightly written that, I, that I, there's, there's so much pride when I see that movie because it sits in a world of naturalism and realism. But as Greta will, will say with pride too, there's very little that's improv in that movie. It's really succinctly um, written. and. And like you said, she was an actress, and I don't know what your experience is working with actors or directors, but I really, really like it. I think there's a language that's spoken that is, um, that's like directing by nudges as opposed to like do this. And, uh, and that's very helpful. I mean, that was one of the big things coming out of drama school for me that was hard to learn was working with film and television directors and realizing, oh, they're not purely focused on my performance the way an acting teacher is saying be as truthful as possible, that wasn't real. They're thinking about the lighting, the set design, the blocking, how they're going to cut it, you know, what the sequence is in the movie. And then maybe somebody's coming over and say, you have 20 minutes to shoot it. Um, so they're not as concerned about that. And then like, if you're working in a dialect or something, that can be, or for whatever physicality, that can be not nerve-wracking, but you gotta, you got to have your own barometer. And that's what was amazing with, with Greta was like, I, I don't know, I, said, I, I saw her last night. It was, I hadn't really seen her since a lot of these nominations came out. It, it's still th I like, what I like to say to her is, I like that you made that movie in total confidence, and now there's this, this great reception. It wasn't like a shit show. It wasn't like she was running all over. And it wasn't like we were throwing it together. It was an assured experience. And yeah. OK, now we can have a few. Oh, god, there's a lot of questions. <laughs> wow, OK, there's a microphone right here, the lady in the red top. Hi. Um, Firstly, Daniel, you're from North London, which I think is so cool because we go to Highgate Wood and St. Aloys just right up from us, and I think it's so cool that there's like a local now on the big, big screen, and oh, we're really good. proud of you. Oh, um, now, both of your films have like really heavy subjects, so race or like sexuality. Is it important for you to make films that impact people and that tell important stories? And what is it like to meet people, like in Call Me By Your Name, if you meet people that have like, their lives have changed because of this film, or if you see black young men talking to you about how Get Out is, like touch them and it's like very real to them, how does that feel for you guys? Thank you. Um, I think anything, I, I'm just kind of a, of a belief, if anything, whether it's like, called by a name or it's Toy Story 3, like, <laughs> they're all about something deep, I think. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like, I just think it means something to the person. It's like the Lego movie. That was deep for me. Like, <laughs> <laughs> hey, that was deep. That film was deep for me. Like, that, 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 but it's, that's, that's what you're tapping in. Everything is awesome. <laughs> Sometimes everything is awesome, bro. Uh, and, uh, and so, um, yeah, that was, that was, that was, and then so, um, I always look for scripts that are personal to the person that's telling it in some way, shape, or form. If someone asks me to do something, I'm like, why do you want to do it? Like, and, and I, for me, it's, I don't know, I, I have no control about how it, I just want to connect in some way. I think that's all we want to do. Like, you just want to connect and make people feel something. Even if you think it's bad, at least it made you feel something. You know, if you just forget about it, that's like, wow. Like, God knows how many people on set and crew and cast and you did you forgot about it? That's crazy. Like, do you know what I mean? It's like, oh, Robbie, you think it's shit. Do you know what I mean? It's like, like I, I, so that's what it is. I feel like it's connect. And then in terms of like, People coming up to me, it's um, 
It's crazy. Like it's 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 crazy. But it's like it kind of feel, you kind of feel like again, it's theirs now. Like I, I, when, I, you, you it, I feel like I do so. We do something as a team, and then it's ours, and then it's out there, and it's yours. Like it's what you think about it. It reveals you and how you feel. So I'm like, well, that's how you feel. That's how you feel, and I'm just happy that you wanted to take it. You know. And we, yeah, I feel the exact same way, and uh, I don't know. I at Sundance, I remember somebody raising their hand and saying that the monologue Michael Stuhlbarg's character gives, he plays Mr. Perlman at the end of the film. You know, they felt like that's a father they never had and a father they needed, and a father they hoped that kids now would have in film representation. And that was really surreal for me. Like I said before, you go on so many auditions, and sometimes you even get cast in things that aren't well received. So to have a moment like, similarly. For me, like for, for me, it was like hearing an album when I was 13 about like anxiety and sadness, whatever, and having that experience and thinking, oh my God, somebody, this is, uh, I'm hearing what I'm experiencing represented. And being on the other side of that equation now where people have been saying that to me, that's what you sign up for, really. I mean, that's why it's awesome to be here for the BAFTAs and, and the award stuff's great, but I think for both of these films, what's amazing is like, it goes beyond that. I mean, I think hopefully like five years from now, people will be still be able to see these movies and, and really get something out of it. And uh, like I said, it's what you sign up for. As an artist, what you dream of is like being able to actually affect people. I, I, I don't know how it's, it's so amazing. Like I don't know how I'm sitting here or it feels like a pinch me moment because if the first dream is to be economically self-sustainable and the second dream is like to, I don't know, uh, feel it in abundance or something, then this is really what you want, you know? This is like getting to affect people, so that's a, that's a good feeling. <laughs> okay, has anyone got a microphone? Um, okay, do you wanna give it to the lady with the purple? Yeah. Um, Daniel, uh, working in Hollywood and playing American roles, I was wondering um, what kind of British story would you wanna make? What kind of uh, film would really feel like a homecoming? Um, and Timmy, I was wondering if you want to play any French roles in the future. Uh, yeah, that, I think that's what that's what the burning urge for like writing is for me is to kind of um, have the British take and and because London's a, as big as New York in terms of like impact, you know what I'm saying? and like what well, the rent is, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? So, <laughs> the city ain't easy. Bro. <laughs> So I'm like, well, we've got to get world class results now. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so it's like, um, yeah, I, and that's what it is. It's just kind of like, I don't, I think I, I had that, but years ago, like, I used to jog around North London, like, Cali, on the Cali, like, around there. And then, um, and then I'll be like, bro, like, it was after a trip to New York. I go, why don't Londoners think? Like, New, like they just don't, like, we always think, oh, we're just doing our thing. And then we're all kind of like really apologetic. And I go, why don't they think? We can just do anything. And that's my kind of where I think um, my brain's head is kind of like, let's do British, contemporary British stories and, and let's show what London is, do you know what I mean? In the vein of like Dirty Pretty Things and mm. a lot of Stephen Knight stuff, do you know what I mean? It's like what well, I feel that he taps in a lot of that and, and Shane Meadows. So that's like the aspiration I kind of want to head. Um, but yeah, yeah, the, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, yes, I would really love to do that and hopefully that opportunity presents itself, it would also be employment, so that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's come to this gentleman in the front here, and then let's line one up, kind of up there. Thanks. Um, so my question was to Timothy about Lady Bird. I was listening yesterday to an interview with Saoirse, and she said that um, she thinks Greta cast the film because a lot of the characters and the actors kind of shared some sort of similarity, but like Kyle does come across as a bit of a dick. <laughs> so <laughs> what were the things about him that you, that positive aspects that you sort of drew from and focused on when you were, just, when you were portraying him? Absolutely. Well, I read for both of the male roles in Lady Bird for Greta, because I was doing a play in New York with one of the producers of the movie, and so I read Lucas's role and I read mine. And I think, I don't know, obviously that role has to play there has to be a tone of antagonism simply by consequence of the fact that she's in his house and then leaves in tears and then has that beautiful scene with her mom in the car. But what made it you know, appealing was I felt like, and this is up to the audience member to describe if this is true or not, because the art takes place in the head of the audience member and not on screen, but I felt like this is a real 
this is somebody who's suffering, and like he says, his father's dying, and he's in a lot of pain, and there's a comedic note to it, just simply by the way some of the lines are, you know, like, that's how it's how you like things like that. But, um, but it felt like a real guy, and like, and, and what's been funny, you know, talking after the movie with some of those people, with, with people that have seen it, is, it, are people saying, I, I know that guy, and, uh, and, or like, it's very funny, sometimes people say, man, I dated that guy yeah. way too many times, and. We've all dated that guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so um, um, but thank God, yeah, I don't see too much of myself in, in Kyle. There's also like a level of paranoia that felt like fun to play with too, and, um, and, and because some of the, so many of those scenes are, were funny, and like there, there are takes where we would break, I think, and like those obviously aren't in there, but that was a big challenge, just feeling like, okay, or not a big challenge, but a, but a challenge, feeling like, okay, this guy is maybe not likable, but do it as groundedly as possible and never crack and never try to make it likable and try to make it as real as possible because I felt like I had played a character in a TV show a couple years ago that was supposed to be an antagonist and I just played an antagonist when I could have tried to see what's this guy actually thinking and actually feeling and uh, not just trying to be negative. In that sense, like like all the other characters in Lady, but it's so well written because, yeah, he's not particularly likable, but then he is really likable in some ways, you know, he is... <laughs> you know, all the shades of grey in between, you know. So in that sense, he's just a normal teenager at the end of the day. And so kind of in that sense, the real testament to Greta are kind of writing him in that way. Yeah. I think we have a question. Yeah. You did well. Um, thank you, both of you, for both movies. Uh, my question is for Timothy. Um, I, I, don't, I hope I don't ruin it for everyone, but I'm talking about the last scene. And... You can take it as his breakdown because of the news he just got from Oliver, but also as a breakdown from the old experience he went through, and it's, it's winter, whereas the summer goes through in Italy, and he's, he's kind of floating through it. So I wanted your input on how you played it and what emotion you put in the last scene. Yeah, I think that's... I, I really like the way you put it. I've never imagined it in the lens of, a, of like, a... Of a, a winter, um, a winter breakdown of sorts. Obviously, as it relates to the summer, I don't know. Again, like I feel like the art takes place in the head of the audience members, so it's it's as you see it. And uh, and I, I, for me, what was if there was something specific to capture in that whole sequence, it was just of uh, you know, Leo comes in with a with a more positive energy that we've seen, and there's the lakas and and he has headphones and dances a little bit, and it was just important to capture that feeling of love lost over the summer and and maybe a feeling of Elio that he didn't pursue it as quickly as he should have or that maybe he's had four months where he hasn't thought about Oliver as often and then he gets his phone call and it's like, wow, that summer was so amazing and I will never share that connection with anybody again. Um, and as you see it in, in the fireplace or the sequence before that, that's however you see it is right. And uh, I, I wouldn't know what the right answer is. Go to just that lady there, and then let's go to this over here. Yeah. Um, a question for Timothy. Uh, when I came out of the cinema with my friend, I think we were both sort of speechless for a good ten minutes after seeing the film. And I just wondered what your initial reaction was when you saw the complete film, and whether at that moment you kind of thought it might become bigger than you'd all expected, or whether that kind of happened a lot later. That you thought yeah, that. well, so, I, you know, I went to school in the fall semester after we shot the movie over the summer, and right after I finished shooting Lady Bird, actually. And the advice I got was to watch it before Sundance, because I wasn't going to be able to watch Like, I wouldn't be able to fully appreciate it. But I wanted to, like, see it in a theater full of people for the first time. So I guess the answer is it's just all very weird because the first time I watched it, it was, it, was like, it was like a thousand people there, so I couldn't really watch it because I was like, man, I'm sitting here with a thousand people and I'm having sex with a peach on the screen. <laughs> and, uh, but then, um, <laughs> and then, uh, uh, but, and then when it ended, I don't know, like, um, Army Hammer, who right. obviously plays Oliver, he had been in Birth of a Nation the year before at Sundance. And the way he had described the reaction when that movie ended, he said it was like an 11 minute thing. <laughs> People were going, were very enthusiastic about it. And it, after Call Me By Name finished, it was more like stunned in the And I couldn't read it. And I knew what it was. I remember Army and I like sauntered backstage and there was this, there was like a photo booth. And like 
we like awkwardly took photos <laughs> and, then, and then just waited and to see what the reactions were going to be. But it was a weird, I didn't, I didn't, I, I couldn't see it the first time. And, uh, and also it was like freezing out. It was like a, it, there was a big snowstorm and they were watching this movie that was, took place in Italy over the summer and, and it was such an immersive experience. It was like being right back there. So it, yeah, the first time I saw it was weird, but you know, in the 73 times I've seen it since. Uh, I, I, I like it a lot. I've not seen it 73 times. Okay. What was it like for you, Daniel, the first time you'd seen Get Out? Where, and who did you see it with? I saw it on a laptop. <laughs> I saw it on a laptop, yeah, before a reshoot. So it didn't have an ending. Yeah. So because he had to recreate mm. what, what we did. Um, and then uh, it was like, I felt really sad. I think this, the film messed me up. Like, because you can't, because it's what, it's what racism feels like. Mm. That, that descent into rage, that, that's, I, I know that. So it's like, so yeah, it was kind of like sad. And, and the end note, because it was still with the police at the end, the police and he gets arrested. Mm. So I was like, oh man, like. And then I watched it in LA and I, I just couldn't really watch it properly. I think it all had been graded, it all had been like all posted finished and I, I just, it's those, those screenings are so overwhelming that you kind of can't really watch the film properly because you just, it's just too much. And then there's a bit with the, the bingo scene when Matt Bradley Whitford's doing the bingo scene. And that's when I kind of kind of relaxed. And I was like, oh, this, I really like this film. I was like, I like it. Hmm. Do you know what I mean? It was like, I like it. It doesn't, and then, and then my friends are there and my family's there. I go, do you like it too? And then there's some said, yeah. Some said. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, that was it. And then I kind of just, and then it's out there. It's not. It's I'd love to know what your parents kind of think at the moment with both of you, kind of, you know, with the success and the nominations, you know, are they keeping you well and truly grounded or, you know, are they just as thrilled for you as everyone else? Yeah, I don't know, it's both. I, I mean, I don't know, I don't know. I don't know, I gotta call them. <laughs> no. Okay, we've got one last question um, and the lady's got the microphone just here. Um, hi, I'm Ayona. I just, again, I really want to thank both of you guys for these amazing movies. Um, I have a question for Timothy. Because now you're really um, working on your craft in front of the camera, have you ever considered potentially dabbling in like writing or directing behind the camera? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And uh, you know, there's a writer director named Xavier Dolan that I'm amazing. a huge fan of because, he's amazing. like, he's. I guess he's 28 now, but you know he made a movie called "I like, Killed My Mother" when I was when he was 19 or 20, mm -hmm. and I mean he's made like a number of Mommy's incredible great. films. Yeah. And Mommy's excellent, Mommy's and uh, Lawrence anyways. So when I see him doing it, that's very inspiring. But I, I, I would be very patient on that. I feel like you know all the universe has told me at this point is you're a good actor. So I got you know that's the only thing I'm trepidatious about going through all this stuff at a young age is this feeling of like. Hey, I want to be back. I don't want it to be like, oh yeah, like, you know, he's a great young actor, and now, you know, so, uh, and I also want to make sure it's not kind of like Lady Bird. You know, the great, the great thing about Lady Bird was it wasn't, you know, an actor directing a movie with like, three minute takes that are, you know, that are unspecific and just feel like life filmed. It was like I'm a writer director, and this is, or, or Get Out too. Like this is exactly how I want it to be done. So if I ever did it, that would be the interest, not to. Uh, you know, capture a tone vaguely and uh, and get the experience of being a director. That that wouldn't be fair. Well, I just want to say I can't wait to see whatever comes next for both of you. And um, congratulations on the nominations, success, the success of both the films. Thank you, Timothy Shamway. Thank you, Daniel Cleaver. <laughs>